All right, good evening, everyone. We're going to go ahead and start the program. I want to thank everybody for coming. This is a fantastic turnout, packed room. My name is Dan Mead Smith. I'm the president of the Washington Policy Center. We're hosting the event tonight. Our, our Gonzaga Club is hosting the event tonight. So thank you for taking time out of your kind of last couple of weeks of school. And I know it's a beautiful evening, but I promise you'll be nice again tomorrow night. So you can go outside tomorrow night. And we appreciate you coming inside tonight. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about the organization um, before we, we get the program started. I want to thank a few people. Um, Miranda Hawkins and Chris Cargill run our Eastern Washington office. Uh, Chris is right here in the front row. Chris has run our Eastern Washington office for the last few years. Miranda has been organizing the event tonight with our, our club. Uh, I want to thank uh, Tessa Shelton, who is our club president here at Gonzaga. If, if all of her team, if you're on the Gonzaga club officers, stand up. And I want to thank you guys for all your hard work tonight. This is the first year we've had an official Washington Policy Center Club at Gonzaga, and they've done a great job. So we appreciate all of their, their help. We have four clubs across the state, University of Washington, Seattle U, Washington State University, and now at Gonzaga. So we're thrilled to have uh, an energized club here on, on your campus. I um, also want to thank our two academic advisors, uh, Mike Fitzsimmons and Dr. Dan Stewart. They've been guiding the club over this first year. We appreciate uh, Gonzaga's support of the club. And then we have three uh, key supporters of the Washington Policy Center that have been active in getting students involved in our events in Spokane and getting the club going. Uh, Rebecca Cates is here tonight with us. Uh, Patrick Hanley and Jim Day, uh, again, three of our supporters who have been instrumental in getting Gonzaga students involved in the Washington Policy Center. So the Washington Policy Center is a nonprofit, nonpartisan public policy think tank. If you've heard of some of the big DC think tanks like uh, Center for American Progress, the Brookings Institute, they're kind of groups on the left, and then the American Enterprise Institute and Heritage Foundation, those are national think tanks that work on federal issues, what's happening in Congress. We're kind of a state version of those. So we're, we're nonpartisan. Nonprofit, we're not connected to a political party. We're interested in ideas and getting the best ideas out to people so they can make informed decisions. We're all about e educating students, citizens, voters all across the state on public policy issues. We have eight different research centers. We have offices in Seattle, Olympia, here in Spokane, like I mentioned, in the Tri-Cities. Uh, we have about a $3 million annual budget. We put on programs all over the state for different age groups, we have a thriving young professionals program. So after you graduate, we hope you engage with our young professionals group, and we hope that you engage with our Gonzaga club if you're, if you're gonna be on campus next year. We have an exciting year planned here on campus. We have internship programs for students. Uh, we also have a scholarship uh, for female college students. So there's, there's lots of ways to get involved with the Washington Policy Center after tonight, and we hope that, that, that you, you do. We really appreciate you coming out uh, this evening. And with that, I want to um, turn the program over to uh, Nadine Woodward. Nadine is well known to folks in Spokane. She's been a long time broadcaster on two different Spokane uh, TV stations. She's been on KXLY. She's host the evening news. Um, and she was named again by the Inlander newspaper as Spokane's top, top anchor. So we're thrilled to have Nadine. Uh, moderating our third debate here on Gonzaga campus. And I'll turn it over to Nadine Woodward. Thank you. I have my lab, my lavalier microphone. Thank you, Dan, and thank you, Washington Policy Center, for hosting this debate. Uh, thank you, Gonzaga University, for um, providing the venue for it. And thank you all for turning out. It's a, when I walked uh, through campus today, I'm like, everybody's in shorts outside and they're throwing frisbees. No one's going to come to this. But uh, you did, so we're very, very thankful that you did. Um, this is a fascinating topic because um, so much of our lawmakers, so many of them, in, whether it's local or at the federal level, are all struggling with all kinds of issues today. And we're going to be talking about a lot of those issues. 
But when they do have this discussion, for the most part, it comes down to the simple question. Do we need more or less government to solve these problems? For example, so many of you are college students here. We're going to talk about college tuition. In order to make college tuition more affordable, do we need more government or do we need less government for that? Health care. Health care affects everybody. And the nation's been struggling to figure out what to do with health care. Well, to make it more affordable and more accessible for everyone, do we need more government or do we need less government? So those are just two of the issues that we're going to tackle tonight. We have a whole list of them, and we're really excited. We want to let you know about the format for tonight's debate, just to let you know that there is a um, panel discussion. We'll have the pro and the con side, and they will have equal time to address the questions, and they also have a rebuttal. But this is what we're going to do. So we're going to start with opening comments from the more government side and the less government side. They'll have three minutes. After that, I'll post a series of questions. Each panel will have two minutes to respond, which they can divide up in any way, two speakers for each side. And then following each side's response, the panel that spoke first will be able to have a one-minute rebuttal. And if the topic is interesting and we think we should go further with it, I'll, I've been given the discretion to spend more time on, on any given topic as well. At two points during this evening, one panel will have the chance to ask a question to the other. They'll have 90 seconds to answer that question. Then the panel that asked the question will have a 90-second rebuttal. And then when we're all done with our questions, we're going to open up to you. So we're going to hopefully save about 20 minutes to 30 minutes to answer any of the questions that you might have. You may have come with questions. Something may pop up in your mind uh, during tonight. If you do ask a question, we want you to text them to us. You'll see the, we have the number up there on the screen. It's also in your program, by the way. And the number is 509, I don't know if it's going to show up, but it's, it's 509-954-954. Two four four nine. It's in your program somewhere, right, guys? Yeah. Okay. And it'll be there. It is right there. You might want to jot that down, or if it's, or if you do have a program, just look at that. And during the program, um, text those in, and then we will cover as many of those as we can to round out our eight thirty closing time. One of the things that we ask during this, we want this to be obviously very, very civil and we want it to be fair to everyone. So we're going to ask that nobody make any noise, don't show support or um, you know, protest against any of the answers, any of the discussions that are being, being said. But we do want you just to welcome um, our speakers. So, so let me introduce them to you right now. On the more government side tonight, Zach Carter is HuffPost senior political economy reporter working out of Washington, DC. His story swiped Banks, Merchants, and Why Washington Doesn't Work for You was included in the Columbia Journalism Review's compilation, Best Business Writing for 2012. He previously worked at Alternet's economics editor. He blogged about economic policy at Campaign for America's Future and served on the steering committee for Americans uh, for Financial Reform. Thank you for being with us, Zach. First time to Spokane, by the way. And you love it, don't you? So yeah, of course you do. <laughs> uh, Dr. Michael Trelevin is an associate professor and chair of the political science department here at Gonzaga. He received his doctoral degree from the University of Toronto in 1993 and his BA from Gonzaga. His teaching work has been focused on studies in political economy, development, comparative governments, and institutions. Thank you, Dr. Trelevin. <laughs> Now, on the less government side of things, Tim Carney is a visiting fellow at the American Enterprise Institute. That's where he works on economic competition, lobbying the political economy, the civil society, and electoral politics. He is concurrently the commentary editor at the Washington Examiner. Mr. Carney writes and comments on the ways in which well-connected special interests use big government to elude market forces and squash smaller competitors. In addition to his columns, Mr. Carney is the author of several books, including Obama. Obama See, that is not easy to say. Obama <laughs> Obama Nomics: How Barack Obama is bankrupting you and enriching his Wall Street friends, corporate lobbyists, and union bosses. Please welcome Mr. Carney. <laughs> 
Obamanomics, Obamanomics, you've got to say it three times fast so you can get it. And Dr. Donald Hackney, is Associate Professor of Business here at Gonzaga. Dr. Hackney has a BA in Economics as well as an MBA and a Juris Doctorate, all from Gonzaga University. He practiced law and previously taught at Gonzaga as an adjunct from 1974 until 2006, where he joined the faculty full time. He has jointly published works with economists on the issue of bankruptcy, emphasizing medical debt, and consumer insolvency. Thank you so much, Dr. Hackney, for being with us. Now, as we begin tonight, we want to lay out the issue um, that we kind of prefaced at the very beginning here, but we want to welcome the president of the GU Washington Policy Center Young Professionals Club, Tessa Shelton, to lay that out for us. Thank you, Tessa. All right. Thank you, Nadine. Welcome, everybody. Uh, on behalf of the WPC Young Professionals here at Gonzaga, I want to thank you for being here tonight in support of our first major event here on campus. Uh, we're really excited about it, so thank you for being here. Uh, so the title of our debate tonight is More Government Versus Less Government. What is the right direction for America? It's an important question. Recent polls show uh, America is actually split on this issue. An NBC News poll from January of this year shows 58% of Americans think the government should, quote, do more. A year ago, 55% of Americans, according to a Gallup poll, said the government was doing too much. 15 years ago, that same Gallup poll showed 30% of Americans viewed the federal government as an immediate threat to the rights of ordinary Americans. Today, that number is up to nearly 50%. Why? Poll respondents said the government is just too big. But perhaps the most striking data is the attitude among uh, members of my generation and many of your generation who are here tonight. When millennials were asked recently what kind of country they'd rather live in, 44% said a socialist country, 42% said a capitalist country, and 7% said a communist country. Tonight, we wish to dive into the divide, specifically on the issues that are driving these numbers amongst people our age. We hear about them every day. Minimum wage, college tuition, health care, taxation, climate change, and our overall well-being. Which poll is right? Would we be better off with more or less government? Well, tonight, uh, we are going to try and answer that question for you. So, thank you. Thank you, Tessa. And then just a reminder, too, if you would look in your program, you'll find a survey. We kind of want to gauge um, or take your temperature on some of these issues. And there are some questions that you might want to fill out. There's also a place in your program for notes. And at the end of the program, we'd love it if you would take this survey and drop it off at the registration table on your way out. And we have a nice little gift for you there if you don't mind doing that. But it is the job of our panelists to try to sway your opinion tonight. So this is kind of a little feedback to see if, if they were successful in doing so. So we're going to begin with our opening remarks tonight from the more government side. And you have three minutes. Oh. <laughs> Stalling there. Um, I want to start by thanking everybody for coming. And I know everyone always says that at the beginning of these events. But I think this is a pretty tough time for our country. And I think it's frankly pretty inspiring to see so many young people at an event, which at least in my day would not have been anyone's idea of a good time. Um, so thanks so much for coming out. I also want to thank Tim. We've known each other for a long time. Uh, he's wrong about so many things. Uh, but <laughs> if he weren't so crazy, there'd be no reason for me to be here. Uh, so this debate is based on a confusion. Um, government is not a quantitative variable that can be dialed up like the volume on a stereo. We're not here to argue for more government. We're not here to argue for bigger government. We're here to argue in favor of democratically accountable exercises of power to address social problems. This is different from talking about the government intervening in a free market. 
Free markets don't exist. There is no metaphysical space where people go about transacting business and doing their freedom absent government activity. Governments define markets, they enforce the rules of fair play in markets, and they provide the means for settling transactions in markets, money. Much of what we take for granted every day in economic life, like say the existence of public corporations that are insulated from legal liability, are not economic facts or immutable laws, they're political choices. Government is an inevitable part of economic life. <clears throat> so the question is not how much government to have, but how to do government. And Peter Thiel, who's the billionaire financier who was behind Facebook and PayPal and destroying Gawker and weird schemes for teenage blood, um, <clears throat> in some of his unguarded moments, he has said that democracy and freedom are incompatible. And I want you to remember that tonight when the other side is talking about government. Because there's a lot of nasty things about government and a lot of what they're gonna say is true. But just ask yourself, every time they say the word government, if you'd feel the same way if they were using the word democracy. <clears throat> Ultimately, the small government position, the neoliberal position, the libertarian position, the conservative position here that we're talking about, relies on a conception of freedom in which everyone is free to someday grow up and be an unaccountable economic princeling, somebody like Peter Thiel. Or if you're not so lucky, grow up to be ruled over by a bunch of unaccountable economic princelings. That hasn't worked out so well. If you look around, we see Peter Thiel's, we see Mark Zuckerberg's, we see Jeff Bezos's. They're all exercising power. They're all governing in a sense, but we don't call them the government. We think there's a better way of doing things. We think the pursuit of mutual security through self-government is the way to go. Okay, less government. Good evening. Welcome, sports fans. Um, I have some notes here, not because I'm not ordinarily independently um, a windbag, but uh, because I'm going to try to cover about 2,500 years of Western civilization in three minutes. So strap on. Um, um, I want to have a framework for our discussions here this evening. And because of this, two minutes, one minute, all this stuff, it's more of a rugby scrum than a debate. Uh, I, I'd like you to know that our arguments kind of come and fit within this intellectual framework. And the framework is I I've, I've support smaller government based upon two separate but overlapping philosophical traditions. The first of this, which is a great surprise to my Jesuit friends, is the Catholic uh, teaching tradition the social uh, doctrines of the church. Um, <clears throat> before we talk about Christians, let's go back to the Greek. Aristotle said we're social creatures, right? So we don't live independently, we live in society. And the uh, Hebrews said, well, what are men? Well, we're men, male, female. We're made in the image and likeness of God. We think, we choose, and more than that, we create, we make things, because the earth is a raw material. Okay, we're social. Okay, so what's that mean? We gather together in political, economic, and civic organizations. Alexis de Tocqueville said Americans were about the joiningest people he'd ever seen. Boy, we love joining and associating with each other. So we join and we do things as a people in a vast, in a vast array of organizational structures, either individually, families, Boy Scout troops, you name it. Okay. The doctr doctrinal point I'd like to talk about principally tonight is the uh, social teaching doctrine of subsidiarity, which is an organizational principle which basically says, don't do for me what I can do for myself. Don't do for my wife and I what we can do for ourselves. Don't do for our children. Community, Boy Scout troop, bowling league, metal detecting club, I don't care. <laughs> and so it's a pyramid with a wide base, narrows towards the top. At the top is the federal government, okay? In a market economy where we practice our independence as free people, we're free, and we make economic choices, a market economy where people are out allowed to make their free economic choices celebrates innovation, creativity, economic liberty, commutative justice, 
efficiency, participation, allocation of resources, and collection and dis dissemination of information. If you don't believe that, get on Amazon. You get all the information you want. Government control, I don't care whether it's democratic or autocratic, limits or eliminates all of these. The creativity, the innovation, the, the spark to create disappears when it's top down. For these reasons, human dignity and freedom, the church endorses a free and robust business economy and um, condemns socialism and communism by name. The founders knew this. Read Madison, Federalist, 51, 46, and 10. Madison says we're not angels. Okay, we know that. I'm not an angel. I have students here. You're not angels. <laughs> but it, how much time do I have? I think you're yeah. done. Am I yeah, done? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> Doggone it. We're going to talk about the Federalist Papers, but it'll take <laughs> no, more time. I, thank you. Yes, thank you, doctor. All right, so we're going to start with the first question. And um, our less government side will start with the first answer. So the question being... We're going to talk about college tuition. Of course, it affects all the students who are here and their families tonight. The costs, as we know, go up year after year. Some politicians have suggested a program in which the government would come in and wipe out outstanding student loans or perhaps pay for community college for students. In fact, the new mayor of Seattle is working on a plan to do just that. But it may require more government, more taxes, more bureaucracy to run the program. The question is, is this the right approach and you have two minutes. Thank you. I'm, I'm glad you asked because the reason tuition is as high as it is at private institutions and at public institutions is because government is too big. So we can start by looking backwards and this is something found in the best economic studies on this. Um, I was just reading one this morning and it said the effect of subsidies of subsidizing student loans has increased tuition costs by more than 90% from the 1980s until now. There's other things that drive up tuition, but if not for government subsidized student loans, tuition in, those, in the last 30 plus years would have gone up only about 14%. And the reason this happens is obvious because what student loans do is it gives the supply side, the demand side of the market, the people who are able to borrow this money, by the way, borrowing money at age 18 when you don't know what the long-term effects are going to be. It's not something I would encourage. It's something our friends there might want to regulate. It's something our government actually does and encourages you to do. That drives up tuition. So now, in response to a problem the government created through subsidies that mostly go to banks, by the way, they're coming in with new subsidies. This is the most typical pattern of big government intervention. One government... Uh, action causes a problem, so then they propose another one to fix it. What will be the unintended consequences of this? Well, one thing is distributionally, I think it'll be pretty unfair. That is, even with free tuition, you will still have uh, higher income people going to college more, and thus it will be a transfer from all taxpayers to the higher income. Uh, briefly, I came to Gonzaga, <clears throat> as I tell my students, last century. Brace yourself. Tuition when I came here, I think it was a prior, was $600 a semester. $600. Now I asked one of my colleagues in the finance department who remain unnamed to run it into a present value calculation, in other words, of adjusted for inflation. You know what you should be paying? $4,700 a semester. If Gonzaga's tuition just stayed equal to um, the national rate of inflation, it would be $4,700 a semester. You know what it is. Mm -hmm. It's a lot higher than that. Thank you. More government side. Uh, on uh, t tuition, on student loan debt, rather, I'd, I'd put the uh, onus on the structure of making uh, graduates start paying off their loans so quickly after they finish up uh, when they're in their lower income uh, capacities and later on, as they develop uh, their careers in that, they tend to have rises in income and a higher capacity to pay back the loans. Uh, Australia, I've read, has a system in which uh, students don't start paying back their loans until, they, until, until their yearly income reaches such and such a point, and they progressively have higher obligations as they go by. 
Uh, I understand student loans sometimes are due 10 years after graduation. Well, most of us aren't in uh, the capacity to pay that quickly, and so default on loans and so on has been high. I think the system designed by government is mistaken. The reason tuitions go up needs to be addressed, mind you, as well. And some of those are from government, I agree. Uh, some of them are from, I think, accreditation committees um, and other sources. Uh, I would say that uh, tuitions go up at a faster rate than my salary goes up. Um, so those are some points I would like. But I think the student debt uh, problem in the United States can be handled it, it with a, a more foresighted uh, administration of it, plan of it. Don't make people at the lower end of their incomes in their work career start having to pay this back so quickly. That doesn't, doesn't make sense. It burdens them and so on. Uh, we're talking a lot about how to deal with the cost, particularly of private school tuition. One cool thing about public goods is you can price fix. You can just do it. You can set the price, and it's what you say it is. We do it all the time with public school tuition. We could just make it zero. It would come out of taxpayers' pockets. Uh, it would address the siphoning off of fees to banks that, uh, that Tim is talking about. If public school is free, we do it for public education up to get grade, grade 12. Why not bring that to grade 16? Thank you very much. And you have a one-minute rebuttal if you'd like to take it. <clears throat> it's interesting that the two subjects we're going to talk about of having a problem are also the two subjects that the government is most heavily involved with in a re regulatory education and health care. So we're talking about we're going to pour more, edu more government into fixing something which they al already caused in the first place. And that's one of the definitions of insanity, is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result. And I, I live in Washington, in the Washington, D.C. area. Zach used to live there. And um, he knows how much money, I mean, I think it's more than any state per capita on the K through 12 students. Also, some of you who study K through 12 education would know you don't have the best educational outcomes just by spending more money on something. Zach's idea to make college more like K through 12 is something I think he might want to reconsider. Thank you. All right, our next question is health care. Costs are continuing to rise. Choices continuing to dwindle. Whenever you, uh, whatever your opinion is on the Affordable Care Act, one thing is for sure it did increase the government's involvement in health care. So more government. The question is, what do we do to lower the costs? And we still have a lot of people who don't have coverage who might want it. Is more government on top of that solution? Single payer, completely government run has been put forward as an idea. What about removing government from the equation altogether? Your thoughts? We're going to start with. Well, we're virtually the only developed country in the world that doesn't offer public health care to all of its citizens as a basic guarantee of citizenship. Uh, we do offer it to our elderly citizens. I see no reason why we couldn't just extend the eligibility age to Medicare from 65 down to zero. Uh, it's really clear that Obamacare increased the role of government in the healthcare sector, and it did it in a really dumb way. There's no reason why you would want to have the existing private health insurance system propped up by a bunch of subsidies. I think one of the, the uh, the nice little techniques that this side is going to be doing is to point out when the government tries to work with the private sector in a particularly ineffective and backward way to say that providing public goods doesn't make any sense, when providing public goods is exactly the way to avoid the kinds of public-private corruptions and price increases uh, that, you, that we've seen. I mean, the idea that the problem with the American health, and health care system is a result of government strikes me as absolutely ludicrous. It's not like everything was fine and dandy in 2008. We've had, we've had a terrible healthcare system compared to the rest of the developed world for the past three decades. Uh, you know, providing these types of goods is complicated and it's difficult and it takes time to set up those programs. But this is something everybody else in the world does. It's just a basic guarantee of citizenship. I'd, I'd say to government, uh, in World War II, as you know, in effect started the present system of healthcare being uh, accessible for most Americans through their place of work. Uh, wage and price controls were on, 
So corporations could compete in a scarce labor market uh, by offering health insurance. And after World War II, that continued. Ta corporations were given tax breaks if they so offered health care and so on. So it is a government creation through the instrument of tax breaks. And many people are quite happy with the system, but doesn't cover everybody. And uh, health care costs go up when people are not covered. They don't regularly get health care. They end up getting uh, coverage late in the game that's very expensive and might have, earlier coverage may have prevented those costs. I, I, think, uh, I think I'm a political scientist. So I'm not sure the USA will ever get to universal comprehensive uh, health care in either a private sector way or a government sector way or some mix of those. Healthcare seems to be, politically, a graveyard for the presidents. Uh, Mr. Truman, as president, proposed uh, health care insurance uh, generally, and that went nowhere. Uh, it, uh, Medicare and Medicaid came in with Lyndon Johnson as president, the last president to have an enduring record on health care insurance. Uh, president Clinton proposed a package that not even his fellow Democrats wanted to vote on and it helped cause the Republican comeback in 1994. And then President Obama got something passed, almost by the skin of his teeth, with uh, negotiations heavy duty with his fellow Democrats and insurance corporations and pharmaceutical companies, and no Republican support. And then uh, just last year, the Republicans with majorities failed to get a dismantling or major reform of the Affordable Care Act. Thank it's, you, Doctor. Thank you so much. Okay. Hate to do that. We're going a little over on the time. You know, when you're on television, you know what a minute 30 is. or two, it is, it's, it's something you learn after like 28 years. I know it really takes a long time. But if we can stay to our time, just kind of keep an eye on that, then we can get to more of your answers. Thank you so much. And then you have a response, too. I mentioned in my opening comments about how open free markets with free citizens uh, incentivize creativity and innovation. Uh, let's take a look at one innovation, LASIK surgery. Many of you, including present company, have had, oh, well, some of you have had LASIK, right? When it came out in 1997, um, eye surgery was $8,000. You know what it is today? 250. So look at the areas of medical care that's um, 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 optometry, uh, uh, the um, veterinary stuff, um, plastic surgery, massive drops in expense. Why is that? Because insurance doesn't pay for it. It's open markets bringing costs down. Bring those market forces to bear on health care. Why should any kid have to pay 600 bucks for an EpiPen? That's nonsense. And, and it's, you need the innovation, the creativity, the competition, all of the positive forces that come together from com competitive market forces. You need that working on health care. You don't need a top-down structural thing that invites graft and cor corruption, crony capitalism, and all of the sins that Tim had mentioned. Uh, on that note, I'll quickly point out, I, I agree that the, the uh, insurance companies, the drug companies, the hospitals largely wrote Obamacare, and I also agree with Professor Tree Levin's uh, sort of pessimism about a, uh, Zach's dream plan. The fact is that once government gets involved in something like health care, who is going to end up winning the day lobbying on Capitol Hill? It's not going to be the patients. It's not going to be mom and pop doctors. It's going to be the guys with the best lobbyists. That's big pharma. That's big hospitals, big insurers. They're going to be the ones driving up the prices and making it less accessible for you. So big government is a home game for big business, which leads to losses for the regular guy. Do you have a one minute rebuttal if you'd like it? So how long do you guys think companies should have the right to charge whatever they want for a medication without competition. How long? Under WTO rules, it's 20 years. Where, where, where's the government in that? The government is saying, you get a monopoly every time you bring a new prescription drug to market. Why do we do that? We don't have to do that. But the fact is, there's no avoiding the fact that there's a public policy decision being made. 
This is a basic thing about drug development. We can talk about innovation all day long. I mean, $600 EpiPens, they're $600 because they have a monopoly. You have to have the government involved in these decisions, and whether they do it right or do it wrong is up to you and your lawmakers and whether you decide to hold them accountable. Thank you. Okay. This is uh, time for the panel to ask one question of the other panel, so the more government gets the first question. If you want to ask the question, and you both have a minute 30. So if you want to ask the question, they'll answer, and then you can respond. So uh, Citibank has been <clears throat> uh, refusing to lend money to companies that uh, sell guns, for, to put it simply. Uh, what should be done about this, if anything? I firmly believe in the right of private market players to participate or not participate in an activity uh, that might violate their conscience. Um, and this was uh, something heavily litigated, obviously, in the Hobby Lobby case and this sort of thing. And I would say that what the beauty of the market is that where Citibank steps out in uh, pursuit of the conscience of the shareholders and the executives, somebody else is likely to step in unless there is a society-wide belief that these gun makers are absolutely terrible. And then hopefully you, um, nobody would step into something that's, that's widely uh, recognized to be awful. But so the beauty of the market is that Citibank doesn't have to participate in something its executives and shareholders find immoral, yet the gun makers, if they're doing something legal that has societal support, will be able to find financing from somebody else. Just a little bit of time. Uh, this whole gun issue has encouraged a lot of what I call moral posturing and virtue signaling. Uh, much sound and what is it? Sound and thunder accomplishing nothing. If the businesses are legal and profitable, they're going to get financing. And I suspect C-First will underwrite some of those loans, whether they know it or not. Thank you. Okay, our next question is on taxation. It is a part of every one of these discussions that we're having. Of course, April is tax month, so people just paid, and hopefully most will get a return. I don't know. We just saw the Congress and President recently pass a major tax overhaul that slashed taxes both, both at the corporate and the individual level. Was that the right thing to do? And if you were in charge, what would be the ideal rate we'd be charging businesses and individuals? And this goes to the less government side first to answer. It was a Improvement on the status quo, it was not as good as it should have been. A real free market tax reform would take, the, the true point Zach is making that taxation is a necessary part of our system, but would have tried to lighten government's hand as much as possible. The main way to do that is to make rates as low as possible and to get rid of all the carve outs and exemptions and deductions. They got rid of some of them, but not enough of them. This is a key thing to remember, that government weighs in by saying, you get tax on every dollar unless you go ahead and spend it on the mortgage of your house and then you get a thing. So a better tax bill would have on the individual side gotten rid of all the exemptions and then been able to lower the rate um, even more. So that, that's uh, the main place that I would start. And as far as what would the ideal rate be, <clears throat> I, I would say it would be as low as possible to fund the necessary functions of government. What is that going to be? I don't know. But if you raise it too high, guess what? It doesn't have that much bang for the buck. There's only so much you can tax rich people in this world. We've never gotten tax revenue above 20% of GDP in this country, no matter how high. Back when we had rates in the 90s, it never got above that high. You still have a little time left. I was glad to see the corporate rate dropped. Uh, the rate 35%, I think, was the second highest in the developed world made American companies very uncompetitive and incentivized them to take their business offshore. We don't need that. American companies need to bring their business to America to employ Americans. And um, hopefully lowering the corporate tax rate from 35 down to 20 was a major step um, <clears throat> in, the, um, in the right direction. Okay, thank you. 
we're, we're talking here about national federal taxes, I'd, I'd pay some attention to the states. Eh? Look, Washington State is one of the most regressive tax systems in the United States. It's also a fairly wealthy state, uh, uh, the most populous state in the Pacific Northwest. And if, uh, if they spend money, what do they spend this money on? Well, uh, comparison, uh, more money is spent on uh, public education in Washington State than in Oregon, Idaho, the two neighboring states. Uh, if you're on welfare, you're better off in this state, in Idaho or Oregon, in terms of a dollar amount. And some other things, the business uh, uh, diversity of Washington State is greater than Oregon or Washington's business diversity. And so this state handles recessions a little bit better than those two. All three states face bound budget requirements. Um, although, interestingly, Washington State doesn't have that in the Constitution. They just have to act like that or the markets would beat them up. So I think we should also pay attention to what m government spends money on. And uh, taxation should, is going to bound to meet the cultural ambitions of a community. Idaho is very different than Washington State and Oregon. Uh, why, the tax system may be regressive or progressive, but I would reckon one wants to find out what the money is spent on too, and uh, on public goods uh, like education, um, health care, uh, the well-being of uh, poor single mother families. That's what I would ask about. You have a little bit of time left. <clears throat> um, companies don't go offshore because of taxes. They go offshore because of labor costs and trade policies. Um, there's a reason why we lost three million manufacturing jobs right after we normalized trade with China and not after the Reagan tax reforms or Bill Clinton's tax hikes. Um, the ideal tax rate is a functional thing. It, what, what, whatever works, I mean, taxes exist to regulate inflation. They don't actually exist to fund the government. The government can always fund itself by spending money because it creates money by spending it. You tax people to keep inflation from getting out of control. Whatever keeps inflation under wraps is fine. Thank you. And you have a one minute rebuttal if you'd like to use it. Well, we could spend a lot of time arguing about jobs going offshore, but there's one thing for God darn sure, there's a heck of a bunch of money offshore that hasn't been repatriated because of American tax rates. That's a fact, and we don't get to pick our facts. That's a fact. I think it's in the trillions, isn't it, Tim? Yeah. Huge sums of money that were not brought back, brought back because people did not want to pay the 35% corporate tax rate. And um, that's reality. You look at surveys. Surveys say Americans think, oh, we should pay about 25% in tax. I would beg for a 25% tax rate. Um, as to a policy, everyone should pay some tax. If you want government, you want government spending on things, then pay some taxes. Everyone should have some skin in the game um, on taxes. Should the wealthy pay more than the poor? Yes. It's distributive justice. But that's it. Red light. You're done. Thank you so much. All right, our next question. Climate change, something, uh, an issue that is... Uh, well, young people care very, very deeply about, I have a college-age daughter, she's always telling me, turn off the water, turn off the lights, it's true. Very important. If the government is going to address it, what is the best way? More government, more regulations, a heavy-handed regulatory approach, or less government, which might be in the form of a revenue-neutral carbon tax, or maybe neither. You guys get to start off. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm in favor of a uh, carbon tax. I'm in favor of it because it uh, imposes a price on an outcome, a, a product of our activity, green, greenhouse gases. We want to reduce these things. We need to do, reduce them substantially and even quickly. But the economy is far too complex to be regulated down that road. Uh, and too many decisions need to be made at uh, very local levels and the individual level. So I think a carbon tax, a serious carbon tax, something that pinches us and moves us in a direction, um, and we make choices about how much we spend on uh, carbon energy. Uh, we figure out the ways we want to spend our income. So here I am, I think, being a 
uh, and generally speaking, I'm, actually I am, very pro-free market and using the price mechanism to um, push, help push down uh, our consumption of green, uh, production of greenhouse gases. I think it's very vital to have a mechanism that everybody's enlisted in, that everybody feels some uh, skin in the game. Uh, the notion that it's somebody else's problem, the corporation's problem or the energy company's problem, well, yeah, sure, but, he's, but if we don't buy into it as persons, uh, we're avoiding our responsibilities. 49% of greenhouse gas emissions in the state of Washington are from motor vehicles, the stuff you and I drive around in. And so we're part of the problem, sports fans, and I think we have to um, be nudged along uh, away. And I must say the few carbon taxes that are, are in place, uh, British Columbia has one, a couple other provinces in Canada, but they're still too mild, in my judgment, to make the dent that needs to be made. So I think that's an, a tool that involves government imposing a tax and a, carb, a revenue neutral one, uh, perhaps, but uh, certainly it's a tool that still puts the choice making in all of us uh, as we go about our daily lives. Thank you. You might get the rebuttal, but we're going to let you respond. <laughs> the, um, the, the worst thing to do would be the, exactly what uh, the previous Democratic president, Democratic government tried to do, which was a really clever federal government plan for how to reduce it. They had these bills called Waxman Markey. Um, I forget what the, the Senate bill was called, but it was created in the way that big government policy tends to be created, which is bit by bit, the interested lobbyists showed up. You had Monsanto showing up saying, hey, why don't you give people carbon credits for using this special farming technique where they don't have to till the soil so that they would then have to use a special Monsanto uh, weed killer and then the special Monsanto Roundup Ready seeds. And just bit by bit, all these little companies got all these little goodies. And it's the same sort of policy making, which is the reason that we now subsidize and mandate the use of ethanol, which is fuel made from corn. It's basically unaged whiskey that you that you mix in the in the gasoline tanks. And um, you know, everybody environmentalists are, are first to say this pollutes the water supply. It actually it, it exacerbates greenhouse gas issues. It needs to get a special waiver from greenhouse gas issues. That's what ethanol does. Ethanol is only a big player in our gasoline economy because of federal mandates, uh, federal subsidies, and that sort of thing. So, and, and you see it again and again on all these policies where the government picks one particular part of the environment and then all these unintended consequences happen. So the two general rules to take from this are, one, there will always be unintended consequences of a government intervention, uh, especially an unprecedented one, and two, the special interests will always be the ones who have the best seat at the table and they're able to rig the policies in their favor and that typically is in a way that hurts the little guy. Okay, you got one minute. So the logical conclusion of Tim's view about lobbyists corrupting government is total nihilism. He's right that in practice lobbyists do all sorts of corrupt things, but it's just not the case that democratic peoples and democratic societies don't hold their governments accountable. When people do things that are bad and corrupt, we have a press that can find out about it, and we have voters who can vote them out of office. All that said, I agree with most of what you just said. Uh, <laughs> I, I do think on, on climate change, it's important not to just look at you know, taxes and regulations, but also to look at infrastructure. It's one of the reasons 49% of all the greenhouse gas emissions in Washington state come from automobiles, is because it's the only way to get anywhere. If you had other means of transportation that were friendlier to the environment and emitted fewer greenhouse gases, then you wouldn't need to take cars. Might be cheaper. Might be a whole lot of social problems that would solve. So if you, if you care about public, public transportation and public infrastructure, this isn't just about getting around town and having convenient subways or being able to get to, I don't know, where do you go from here? Seattle, Montana? Uh, <laughs> uh, high speed rail, you know, these, these are things that other countries do all the time uh, and they do them mostly for convenience, but we could also do them for their environmental impact. Well, we're starting to run out of time, but I wanted to give the less government a chance to ask your question to, to the other side, and you both have a minute 30. Thank you. You want there to be more government, so my question is simple. 
explain to everybody in this room why you want Donald Trump to be more involved in their lives. <laughs> You know, your friend there said, uh, he quoted Aristotle to start, uh, that uh, man is a political animal. Um, I think it's obviously the case that the United States um, elected a bad president in 2016, uh, and this is, a, this is the thing that happens. But there are some problems that can only be solved collectively, and your options are between people who are democratically accountable solving those problems and people who are not. If Donald <coughs> Trump screws up, you can throw him out of office. If Jeff Bezos screws up, you can't do anything about it. You can choose not to shop with him, but he's still gonna be around. There is no market control, there is no individual control over what Jeff Bezos wants to do with himself. And in the current economy, in the current world, Donald Trump's got a lot of power, but the people who really exercise influence over your daily life, it's not really Donald Trump. I'm worried about him getting us into a freaking crazy war for no reason. I'm worried about him, I, I don't know, embarrassing us on the international stage. But the people who are really terrifying are the people who are getting paid to spy on you. That's Facebook, that's Amazon, that's Google. These are fundamental, uh, fundamental parts of all of American commerce. They exist, you have no way of holding them accountable or reforming their business practices. I would much rather have some sort of democratic mechanism on the exercise of power than to have these economic princelings going around doing whatever they want. Um. OB Shred on time. Pardon? <laughs> <laughs> Can you make it super quick? Like yeah. Briefly, I think President Trump's administration is so chaotic that I find it difficult to think it's going to. I mean, they, they make many mistakes, and they're understaffed. It's, uh, it's colossally um, chaotic and unimpressive. So I don't approve of it, but um, in some way, one just hopes for something different in November and something different two years after that. All right. Thank you so much. You get a minute. 30, 40, 45. Minute 45. Minute 45. Sure. Oh, boy. Sure. I, I didn't get to talk about the Federalists, so I'm going to jump right in right now. Um, <laughs> Madison studied every democratic government going back to ancient Greece. Everyone failed. Everyone failed. And they failed because when you concentrate power with government, eventually their control diminishes your liberty. There's an appetite for power. Lord Acton says power corrupts, absolute power corrupts, absolutely. There's a reason we have checks and balances, countervailing powers in our system. We do not want too much power going into the fingers. People talk about Donald Trump, ha ha. Well, how about Hillary Clinton, ha ha. Frankly, I don't want either one of them making a whole bunch of decisions about my life. I'll make my own decisions, thank you. I want to be left alone by that class. The deep state that the Trump voters all yip about is real. What kind of control do I have over administrative agencies? How much control do I have over any of these millions of federal workers that are ginning up regulations in the dark like uh, mushrooms? You have no control over it. You don't vote them out of office. They're there. Trump comes, Trump goes, Obama comes, Trump goes. The, the uh, administrative agencies where most of the regulatory burdens that businesses that try to operate in this country have to deal with are absolutely unresponsive. They're absolutely unresponsive to the common citizen. They're outside of our control. They're not subject to our vote. And, um, and that's why Jeff Bezos, I don't worry about him. I, wish, I don't have Facebook. So they're not going to get my data. I don't have any. <laughs> yeah, they will. All right, that's perfect, perfect. Well, it's about 8 o'clock, and that's when we wanted to get to your questions that you've texted in. And so I'm going to throw things over to Tessa and she's collected all of those questions. She's going to actually ask the questions, and each side will have one minute to respond. All right. So we are going to start off with a question that was texted in, obviously. Um, so more government is a wonderful idea. 
And I'd be all for it if those in power hadn't shown over and over again that they make policies based on the pressures of their sponsors and fellow party members and not based on the voice of the people. If the government regulates everything, who will regulate the honesty of the government? Voters. Voters. Was that your full answer? <laughs> I teach state and local government just now. Um, the federal government's uh, number of employees in the civilian sector has been stable for years, around 2 million, maybe down a bit lately. Uh, state and local governments employ something like uh, 5.4 million employees generally. And most of the bureaucratic activity we encounter is through state and local governments, some of it mandated and commanded by federal governments. Um, administrations, Republican, Democrat alike, in the national level, but, um, and some of it for good purposes and maybe some uh, controversial at least. Um, I don't, uh, the USA is, is uh, relatively uh, under-governed compared to its sister democracies around the world. Um, and I would put the way it does the business of government explains this. Uh, as Tim has pointed out, uh, at the level of the US Congress, uh, interest groups play a very huge role in the system. And the parties, both of them, are highly permeable to this influence. They may be, attract different interest groups at times, uh, but they're both highly permeable. And uh, giving the parties more autonomy from those things would be a sweet thing, and maybe they would become more responsive uh, to voters. I would add that at the primary system, only about 20% of Americans vote in the primaries on average, and that means that maybe uh, the final candidate in the general election represents really a choice that a small, small section of maybe highly committed, maybe highly doctrinaire voters um, chose. Um, Thank you. Thank you so much. Sure. Can you take a minute to respond, answer the question? Yeah, I'm, <clears throat> I have to repeat myself, I'm of that age. The administrative bureaucracy that affects most Americans' lives is absolutely unresponsive to political pressure, period. Their, their lifetime uh, employment typically it's frustrating to the presidents. The presidents get in there, they don't have any control over it. That's a, a reality. Back to Madison, he says, we're not angels. That's why we need government. But he said the real key is the fact that we're not angels. We have to be governed by people that aren't angels. And how do we control them? And so our founders spent a great deal of time structuring a government with limited powers, checks and balances, countervailing powers, all to avoid that very natural and perpetual, eternal human characteristic to want power, and if you have power, you will use it and you will abuse it. I don't, there's no question people like power. If you don't think so, go to the driver's license department and stand in line to get your license done. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, next question. With the evidence of how effective single-payer health care has been in other developed countries, should the U.S. adopt this system? When we look at single-payer health care, you know, well, the first answer is the United States, because we have a market economy, we end up subsidizing a lot of the innovation that uh, occurs in medicine because the companies see the money to be made off of the market economy. So the, the single payer or, or socialist health uh, care countries are free riding on us. But also we look at it and as a person who, as a, as a Catholic who believes fully in the dignity of every individual, I really get worried when you think about government, when you think about politicians and bureaucrats making decisions about our lives, about our health care. And when you, you look at when the taxpayers are paying for my heart surgery, the government then gets to say, wait, no more donuts for you, no more fried chicken for you. So when you introduce a single payer government, a single payer health care system or a socialized health care system, you get to the point where you really limit 
human dignity, individual liberty, and frankly, the control over your own body and your own life. Thank you. So we don't have terribly good poverty statistics going back this far, but anybody know what the elderly poverty rate was in 1932? It depends on who you talk to, but it's somewhere between 68 and 80 percent living in poverty. And poverty in 1932 really sucked. You know what it is today? It's about 10 percent. Do you know why? Social Security and Medicare made it affordable to be old in the United States. And if you're worried that bureaucrats are going to make unaccountable, terrible decisions with your life, just ask anybody who gets Social Security or Medicare if they want to give those up. Go ahead. I don't know of any of the other uh, Western democracies in which have uh, single payer or some version thereof where the medical profession is dictated to um, any more, at least, than they are dictated to by insurance corporations here in America. Uh, but the elected politicians of the day uh, are going to hear the complaints in those countries and be responsible to them. Uh, I, I'll admit that this is mystifies me about the USA. I'm a Canadian, and honestly, I, I don't understand the USA on health care. Uh, you guys have got it wrong so far. Okay, thank you. All right, this one's a little bit long, so get ready. So before um, Hugo Chavez, Venezuela was regarded by many as the crown jewel of Latin America. Chavez campaigned public programs and the concerns of the common man over big oil companies. Venezuela now finds itself on the verge of collapse under his watch. Average Venezuelans suffer from daily power outages, extreme rationing, and long food lines. Many are fleeing to neighboring Colombia, who has recently decided to close the borders. And, uh, is this not pragmatic evidence that socialism does not work? The uh, previous uh, administrations in Venezuela um, also wrecked that economy. And I'm not excusing Chavez and his successor they mucked it up in a royally bad way. But there's a history to this going back to the original oil boom in Venezuela that, uh, that the uh, Christian Democrat Party uh, uh, mismanaged and misdirected that economy in, in structural ways. And when Chavez and his socialism regime came in, uh, the thing was already a mess. And they made it worse, no doubt. I have to uh, laugh when people defend socialism. It's never worked anywhere, ever. And it's, oh, if we just do it right, it'll be great. Uh, Margaret Thatcher describes socialism as a great system until you run out of other people's money. And um, <clears throat> the church condemns socialism because of what it does to human dignity and freedom. And uh, Venezuela probably wasn't perfect uh, most of South American countries have struggled with problematic governments. However, whatever was wrong, Hugo Chavez put on steroids. I mean, massive, worse. One of my Venezuelan students came uh, up last semester, great kid. He showed me pictures of little babies over in Venezuela in uh, cardboard boxes. Can you believe that? That's what they put the babies in in the... Uh, nursery in the hospitals. It's a failed state. And um, I'd like somebody to explain to me how that's a good idea, ever. Can I make a, I, I want Zach's defense of socialism, because I know he has. Sure. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I'm against uh, butchers and gulags and that stuff. It seems pretty bad. Uh, but I'm just flabbergasted when people say things like socialism has never worked. The United Kingdom, Norway, Denmark, Finland, where are the gulags? There are no gulags there. They also don't have poverty. You know what happens if you're homeless in Norway? They give you a house. What's the problem? The idea that we're going to run out of money is a, is a complete confusion. Ever since we left the gold standard, you cannot run out of money. What you can do is print too much money and cause inflation. And so you need tax taxes. You need things like the Federal Reserve to keep inflation under control. 
But the idea that the richest country in the history of rich countries, we produce $19 trillion in wealth every year, and yet we have 40 million families who are food insecure? That is insane. That is totally insane. These are easy problems to solve. Other countries have no problem doing it just by providing public goods. I don't see why uh, the people on the other side of this debate are so reluctant to the obvious successes that we've seen in, in Western Europe and Northern Europe. Do you have another question? Okay. So uh, this is taking a little bit of a different <laughs> approach here, but uh, what would be the pros and cons of a small government um, approach to the immigration crisis in Europe? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody's really concerned about Europe. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I will answer just to start on, on immigration in general. I, the, the Europe twist there really threw me off. That was a breaking ball. Um, I, it's, this, this gets into some of what Zach was talking about earlier. There are some issues where small government, big government is kind of the wrong frame because Frankly, if you're going to even talk about a democracy, you're talking about people making rules for themselves. And one of the foundational rules has to be who we are, who is included in we. So people making rules for who gets to become a citizen, who gets to enter the country, is one of the things that any government is going to do as long as it's a, a government. It's like uh, defining property rights or, or issuing currency or that sort of thing. But what I would say, the way you apply the small government lens to this question is by being as neutral as possible trying to make it so that the government isn't favoring one group over another. Currently, we have diversity uh, visas, and we go ahead and we try to make sure we get a certain number from every country. So we end up uh, sort of picking winners and losers. I would go towards a more basic, it's f first come, first serve, but with screening for, for security. That neutrality is often the small government approach in issues where the government is necessarily involved. So I, uh, I think the immigration problem is actually quite a bit more thornier than most liberals um, want to acknowledge. H however you decide to screen people coming into the country, um, your standards are inherently arbitrary and unfair. There's just no getting around it. Uh, if you exclude people from certain countries or regions of the world, you're being racist. If you exclude people based on certain skills, you're discriminating essentially based on income and telling poor people and refugees they can't come here because we want to have rich, talented people come here. Um, I think it's a really hard question. Um, I think the United States can clearly afford to be more generous than we are with refugees. Um, in Europe, I think you have an enormous amount of turmoil that is being caused, uh, not exclusively by the, uh, by the uh, immigration problem, but clearly uh, the, European, the European Union is not making things easier um, with the, uh, the mismanagement of the European economy. I, th I think immigration pressures do lead to the rise of these right-wing governments, but so do the austerity programs that tell people, they create this artificial scarcity that make people think it's a contest between, you know, the people who live at home and the people who are coming in to get these goods. Uh, you know, if you don't have austerity governments, that's just not true. Uh, and you can avoid that, I mean, it's within limits. Uh, but clearly when you have several million refugees coming into the country, uh, you're gonna have a problem. It's maybe one reason why you shouldn't do dumb wars in Iraq, but uh, you know, I, I don't think Tim would disagree with that. So, all right. So, next question: uh, Is capitalism creating less competition? What are the solutions? If so, capitalism creates more competition. Capitalism drives profits down to as small as possible. What creates less competition is big government. Jamie Dimon, the, pre the CEO of JP Morgan, when the Dodd-Frank financial regulation bill was being debated in 2010, he called these regulations a moat, the, the things that keep people out. Uh, the CEO of Goldman Sachs, uh, Lloyd Blankfein, said, we will be the biggest beneficiaries of this. And you've seen since Obamacare, hospitals consolidating. What creates less competition is big government. Capitalism is really an, an unfortunate word. It doesn't describe what we're talking about, which is a market economy or a business economy. It's simply an economy where free citizens make free economic choices, make decisions about their own perceived economic self-interest. The more we encourage that, 
the better. And what Tim is talking about, he's absolutely spot on, is government uh, ends up in a uh, kind of a dark conspiracy with the biggest corporations to to um, raise barriers to entry for competitive from competitors to come up from the bottom. And so you have a system of crony capitalism, which is epidemic in South America. And what you want to do is not have government picking winners and losers and obstructi obstructing entry. If you had real competitive pressures brought to bear on healthcare costs or even school costs, you would see costs dropping, just like LASIK surgery. So more economic freedom is better. We're all innovators, we're all creators, we're all thinkers. Bring that energy to bear um, in, a, in an open, uh, open system. Thank you. I think industries vary. Uh, some uh, should certainly be uh, less regulated or not, not be uh, directed by government, but we're not that far away from the big financial crisis of 2007, 2008 where a whole series of relatively unregulated banks, uh, have deregulation uh, had come in, bipartisan support for that years earlier, and these deregulated banks were considered too uh, big to fail and were bailed out by the federal government of the United States. Had those regulations stayed in place rather than being removed a few years earlier, those bank failures would largely have been avoided in the bailouts, therefore. So maybe some institutions in the capital sector need a government to set up the rules of the road in the same way we need traffic laws to keep us from banging into one another. Oh, we do a good job of that on our own anyway. And uh, I covered Dodd-Frank, so I want to make a few points here. Um, what I said at the beginning about uh, this not being a question of more or less government, you know, one option that was on the table in 2008 wasn't writing a whole bunch of complicated new rules. It was just breaking up the biggest banks so that if they got in trouble, they would fail and not threaten the entire economy. Is that a big government solution or is that a small government solution? To my mind, that's a solution that's in favor of more competition and letting market mechanisms and competition work. Now, that wasn't the way Republicans in Congress saw it at the time, but you can see a good faith conservative position being in favor of exactly that idea. It just so happened that it was like the radical left in Congress, to the extent that we have a radical left, uh, it, that, that was in favor of it. Now, one thing about Jamie Dimon, it's true that he said this thing about moats. It's also true that in 2014, he, he lobbied to repeal a big chunk of Dodd-Frank and lobbied successfully. So there's a, quite a bit in there that uh, the big banks don't like. Okay, thank you. Are you good? Oh, we got Good. more time. Okay, okay. awesome. Yeah. Okay, so next question. Um, how do you feel towards military spending in regards to government size? I think the military, like every other part of government basically, is too large. And the reason it's too large is because in our system where the what, what big government spending basically means is that there's this multi-layered democratic system where some people get to choose how to spend the money that's taken from all the people. And that, again, the people with the most access will be the people who can hire the former generals or former senators to be their lobbyists. And guess what? Boeing and Lockheed and the other uh, big military industrial complex players, they have that access. So our government wastes tons of money in our military, in part because anything that large is going to be inefficient. I, I, um, even big universities are going to be, uh, have lots of inefficiencies built into being large. That's inevitable. But also because the way Washington works, the giving more power and more spending authority is like throwing out a raw piece of meat and then the flies all come in and the maggots all come in and they're the lobbyists for the special interests. So I do think that our military spending needs to be high in order to keep us safe, but I think it's way too high in, for the same reasons that most government spending is too high because special interests profit from more government. I'd add that uh, prolonged uh, war in Afghanistan and Iraq, trillions of dollars, uh, political mistakes in, uh, in some ways, uh, insoluble problems in others have uh, uh, run up the bill. Uh, but I don't disagree with the point. I think uh, the, 
what President Eisenhower warned about the, pres the military industrial complex is a, a serious issue and Congress uh, is both uh, a failure on regulating it and um, over the years and so is the executive branch. Um, uh, Republican presidents, I, I, don't, I don't really disagree with what Tim had to say there, uh, but Republican presidents also use military spending as a Keynesian countercyclical measure. Uh, it's a way for them to run up essentially large deficits by spending a lot of money to prop up the economy uh, without acknowledging that they're doing it. Uh, Ronald Reagan was particularly innovative in this field, but Richard Nixon was too. And of course, we, we know George W. Bush in the Iraq War. Um, <clears throat> the, the point here is that, you know, I'm, I would rather us not spend money on bombs, but you know, if, if, uh, if we want to spend a lot of money to support the economy, I don't have a problem with it. I'd just rather see it be on schools and theaters and houses. And, uh, you know, you do, have to, you do have to look out for corruption. That's a thing that happens. Graft exists. I mean, I live in New York, and the subway system is disgusting. Um, but, uh, but look, there, it's been, we've had better subway systems in the past. There are, there are ways to deal with these problems. All right, thank you. Um, next question. Should the minimum wage be raised on a federal level or should it be left to the state, if not a more local level? I don't believe in the minimum wage. Uh, I think the federal government should provide a job guarantee. I believe Bernie Sanders rolled out this proposal uh, this morning, but it's an idea that's been in academic economics for the past 20 years. The federal government should just guarantee everybody a decent paying job with decent benefits. It's a good way to regulate inflation. Uh, anybody who wants to work should be able to have a job. Uh, if, if you want to go to work, there's plenty of work to do. There's trash on my street in New York. There are always schools to build. There are always houses to paint. Uh, anybody who wants to work should be able to get a job. That's the way we should regulate, you know, welfare to work type of issues. Uh, you know, we, we don't necessarily need to be putting these burdens on private businesses. That said, a $15 minimum wage, when you do it, you do want to do it nationwide if that's the way you're going to approach this sort of thing. If you do it market by market, you just give people incentives to, you know, business owners incentives to move from one locality to another where labor costs are lower. Yeah, I'm pretty agnostic on minimum wage laws. Uh, most people in, in work full time are making more than minimum wage, but there's still an awful lot of people who are living below the official poverty level, which is a highly uh, questionable um, measure in the first place. And that's why there's this earned income tax credit that the federal government and some state governments have it as well, to boost family income by a transfer of cash to a two-person, two-adult household with dependent children is usually the, the game there. And both adults working full-time but at low wages, and so their household income is uh, beneath the poverty line. Um, minimum wage laws... Um, I, I, I'm not the economist, but they, I come down to the view that they're mainly, um, uh, uh, I don't know, maybe window dressing. Thank you. King Canute of um, England, a Saxon, <clears throat> took his throne out to the beach and ordered the tide to quit, uh, which it didn't. He got wet. Minimum wage jobs are the modern day equivalent of King Canute in the tide. You do not determine wage rates by government fiat. They don't work. Like many things, they're wildly politically popular, but they don't work. They destroy jobs, they destroy entry level jobs. UW, hardly a hotbed of conservatism, um, just had a uh, study on the minimum wage statute in Seattle where they indicated it cost 5,000 jobs, a 6% drop in aggregate uh, payroll, which would work out to, uh, I think, $125 per month for the affected families. That's a big thing. And uh, it, it, listen, if $15 works, let's go for $100. Why not $200? Well, we'll make everybody wealthy. So minimum wage laws don't work. And they get rid of entry-level jobs. They get most of those people, typically students, that are in those like, fast food jobs. They're learning job skills. They're learning the soft skills about showing up for work. They're not family wage type positions. And we should find some way as a culture of encouraging businesses to bring those new workers into the workforce with entry-level wages that are commensurate with their value to the, to the firm. And anything else, you're just, you're just kidding yourself and you're legislating jobs 
out of business. That's the time we have. Did you want to just say something really quickly? Okay. Tessa, that was our last question from the audience, so thank you for your great questions. And now I'll offer some final thoughts. WPC's Eastern Washington Coordinator Miranda Hawkins is going to come up. Thank you, Nadine. Thank you, everyone, for coming tonight. Events like this are very important, especially on college campuses. And they're needed because it's a chance to hear both sides of an argument. How many of you tonight learned something new? Please raise your hands. Now take a look around. <laughs> Washington Policy Center strives to get young people involved in policy, knowing that over time, sound research creates an environment where good public policies are made. And that's what the Young Professionals Program at Washington Policy does. It gets young people empowered, educated, and encourage them to make a positive difference.